I know we see a lot of people in the sanctuary, but it's nothing in comparison to what we see in our global campus family. And so for that, I just want to welcome you as always, but love on you extra special today. It's your day for celebration. It's your day for acknowledgement. It's your day for me to give you your flowers and thank God that every single week you are with me. You are with the congregation. You are with God and the ministry and mission of this church. So thank you. In the room, make some noise for the global campus. Now, everybody, grab your Bibles and let's get to work. Join me at John, the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 15. Help me, Holy Ghost, preach through me and to me. Let the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight as the people make their way towards this truth. Let it deposit into our hearing in our hearts exactly what is needed. In Jesus' name, amen. John 5, 1 through 15. Thank you, Lord. John 5. 1 through 15. This is a new series that we're starting today. I'm kicking it off. Uh, we had something else planned. I had a guest speaker that was coming but had a family emergency. She will be here on May 15th, which is also the day that we are launching our South, I'm sorry, our Victory City Atlanta campus. Somebody just make noise right there. VCA, we love you. VCWC, VCC, VCA, VCD is coming. <laughs> VCA, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. <laughs> yes, I can see Victory Zimbabwe. Yes, I can see it. <laughs> So just please understand that we are excited today more than just because we're in the house of God with the people of God and we feel the power of God. But Victory City Atlanta is here. Just share some love with them. Come on. So my prayer is that this series will minister to your hearts, to your minds, to the seat of your emotions and your health in a way and in ways that you have not experienced previously in church, possibly, and or maybe not even in general, that you've not dealt with some of the things that you need to deal with. The speaker that is coming on the 15th, listen to me, lay in my heart, do not miss it. You need this for your life. It is a truly important moment in time. The speaker that is coming is an extraordinary individual because she's an ordained minister. She is clergy. She serves under Bishop T.D. Jakes in the Potter's House in Dallas. But in addition to that, she's also a clinical psychologist. So uh, she is absolutely amazing. Amazing. She is a phenomenal teacher, speaker, preacher, clinician. Uh, she has a phenomenal podcast. I want to give you more information. I know y'all like, who is it? Who is it? Stay tuned. After these messages, we'll be right back. I'm going to make you show up. <laughs> but trust me, hear my heart. Hear my heart, please. From the depths of my soul, I beseech you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, that you do not miss that most important sermon selection because it is going to minister to us in ways that are both practical, spiritual, emotional, cognitive. And here's the thing that I believe that God desires. My beloved, above all, my desire for you. This is not what I think. It's what he said. Beloved, above all, my desire for you is that you prosper. Watch this. And be in. Amen. Say it again. Amen. Come on for the Bible readers and the non-Bible readers. Make sure it's loud and clear. Good health. God's desire. His passion. His heart's passion for us is that we be in good health, not just in good financial condition. Come on, somebody, but that we be in good health because he knows that without our health, we lose our wealth. Your health is the, is the, is the seed of your capacity to even produce wealth. It is God who gives you the ability to produce well. So it is God who fearfully and wonderfully orchestrated and created the very systems and organs and the essence of your whole being. Your existence is a compilation of his meticulous wisdom and his masterful artistry. Your ability to function is predicated upon God giving you the capacity to do so. But even important, more important than that, your ability and your willingness to do the work 
to maintain what you've obtained. Let me give it to you a different way. Nobody's going to Walmart, Target, and bought a body. You might go to the doctor, they may snip, tuck, add, augment, supplement, or whatever meant, devil meant. But at the end of the day, you get one. And so I think a lot of times we miss out on the fact that God's desire for us is that we are healthy. But here's another, here's another part. When we think health, we think, you know how we say it in, in the uh, African-American tradition, my sugar diabetes is under control. <laughs> my blood sugar levels are normal. Let me say it the right way, okay? We say, Yo, you know, I don't have hypertension, high blood pressure, no stress and anxiety. I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm okay. No heart disease. My sickle cell is under wraps so or I've gotten a transplant and now I'm healed and delivered from it. You got all these other things that we think about. When we think about health, we think about the physical and the anatomical things, the physiological capacities of our own body. But very rarely when we think about health, especially in the African American or the color uh, or the people of color communities. Very rarely do we think about emotional health. But if your emotional health is off, watch this, your physical health will be off. If you don't know how to handle the emotional dynamics of life, you will not be able to function anatomically, physiologically towards the other areas of life. Hypertension. <laughs> if you learn how to lower certain dynamics of stress, anxiety, depression, if you deal with the trauma, the PTSD of your yesteryears, if you dig into the place that your family has taught you not to touch, We don't talk about that. And that is the problem. That's why I'm creating a demonic cycle in our family, in our bloodline, because we don't touch that. We don't talk about that. We don't deal with that. And because we don't deal with that, watch this, it's dealing with us. The Bible says I take captive every vain imagination that exalted itself from the knowledge of God. And so how, how do I take captive my thoughts? I put it under the subjection of God's truth. And the problem is we don't want to bring it under subjection because we don't want to acknowledge it's real. You'll be all right. You're fine. It's good. As a matter of fact, we get so consumed with this, this variable of our own daily function that we don't address it, we don't deal with it. It begins to deal with us and then ultimately it begins to become a generational curse because we don't even realize the manifestation of certain behaviors are taking place. Let me give you an example. You said, I'll never be like my mama. I'll never do what my daddy did. And if you live long enough, <laughs> you start seeing little. And then you become exactly like them because you won't, e you won't even acknowledge that you got an issue. Let me, let me, can, can I just talk about me for a minute? Y'all good? You got on your extended shoes today, right? Stay standing, come on. Let me just talk for just, just one second, just one second before I get into this word. So, and I want to make sure that I preface this, you know, I, I got to do this in order to illustrate and illuminate to you that it's okay. Tell your neighbor it's okay. Okay. 
let me tell you what I learned. <laughs> in the process of my own development, my own maturation, my own growth, my own wrestling matches with me, I learned that the person sitting next to me is wrestling with the same stuff, if not worse, but neither one of us telling each other or talking about it to anybody. And so it's becoming an internal pressure and stressor. And as a result, I don't even think it's okay that I'm having this wrestling match. The problem is when you stop fighting it. The problem is when you stop dealing with it. The problem is when you stop seeing it, acknowledging it, wrestling with it, fighting it. The problem is when you don't find somebody professional, clinical, that can help you understand it. The Bible says in all, well, I don't, I don't want to go to therapy because if I go to therapy, it doesn't do anything. No, but you do. It gives you the tools so you can fix it. You can deal with it. You can handle it. Let me tell you, I went to counseling. <gasps> Pastor went to therapy. It was either go to therapy or cuss everybody out on Sunday morning. We don't want to talk real today. I see that. It's cool. It's okay, y'all. <laughs> it's okay. I went to counseling. I went to therapy. Because I said, God, I'm not okay. I remember laying in bed with my wife. I rolled over and I said, honey, I'm not, I'm not okay. I don't know what's wrong. I don't get it. I don't get I'm not okay. So I found a Christian. I didn't want a Christian counselor. When you get on an airplane, you don't ask for a Christian pilot. You just want them to fly. <laughs> Nobody goes in the doctor and says, I'm sorry, are you a Christian? No, you say, no, no, no. It hurts. Cut it. What you got to do? And so I, didn't, I found a counselor who is a Christian, but it's not a Christian counseling. It was a clinical counselor. And so let me tell you what that did for me. It taught me, it, first of all, it gave me the vocabulary. Because it's hard for you to deal with what you cannot name. It gave me the vocabulary and it gave me techniques and tools and it taught me my triggers. And when you can get your techniques, your tools, get the vocabulary and learn your triggers, you got a fighting chance to be okay. And so we don't talk about it. We don't deal with it, especially in our traditions of color. And I don't want to isolate and relegate it to that because all people in all people groups have issues and sometimes struggles with this dynamic. I just know I've been black all my life. Our context, I ain't going to see no counselor because I ain't crazy. Actually, <laughs> so I'm going to teach you, talk to you, preach to you, train you, coach you all month that It's okay. It's okay. You're not by yourself. You're not the only one. And let me tell you why the cycle has continued. This is why the, the enemy has been able to prevail through generations. Because we don't understand that the power of our ability to share our testimony is somebody else's power of deliverance. <laughs> Revelations 12 and 11 says we overcome the enemy by the power of the blood of the lamb. We'll deal with that. I start pleading the blood, it's going to turn the place upside down. We'll deal with that. But we miss out on the word of our testimony. My mother broke a generational curse and don't even know she did it. It was, it was, it was, and I don't even know if it was necessarily a curse in that it was just ignorance on the part of our family because we had to learn things under duress. We had to learn under pressure. We had to learn under negative and toxic modeling because we had to endure bondage and slavery. And we had to endure the Jim Crow era. And we had to endure the abuse and all of the things that we endured as a people group. Are y'all with me? So I want you to understand historical context. 
because historical context will help you to understand it's okay. It's okay that that is what we learned in that process, but it's not okay to stay in a place when you know that there is a better way. So my mother, my, my babies, I think it was Trey, um, poor baby. <laughs> my mother and father, they did an exceptional, extraordinary job raising my brothers and I. I mean, we had everything that any child could desire. Love, an over and abundance of love. We had discipline, and I mean, we had discipline. I'm talking about that look at you across the room and you say, uh-oh. We had discipline, we had provision, we had safety, we felt safe. I always would tell you in a heartbeat, I'll be right back, let me go get my daddy. We had security, we had everything. My mother made sure that we had independence. She says, you're gonna learn how to cook, you're gonna to learn to clean, you're gonna learn. We had everything that you could ask for. But the perpetuation of a cycle had existed in our family. And so my mother doesn't even know, and she's probably about to pass out right now because she's like, what is he about to say? But mama. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> so when my, my babies were babies, my immediate go-to was to whip them, was to lay hands upon them, not in a holy way. It was holy, but it wasn't holy. Are you with me? I mean, they blinked wrong. I was beating them. I mean, little bit. I said, no, I got to get them. You are not. And I had a strong, strong arm with them. And my mama, it was amazing because my mama became not my mama. I, 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 my, mama, mama my, my mother became her mama. And I saw it happen instantly because this is the same one that would walk through a wall if we whispered wrong. Who are you talking to? It's the same woman that would talk through her teeth and heaven would stand still. I said, sit down. My mother could become a baritone in a matter of seconds. I said. But all of a sudden, she pulls me she, to the side. She says, son, she said, if I had known better, I would have done better. You don't always have to beat them. And that's all she said. She didn't push it. She didn't raise her voice. She was real calm. She was just like, son, I did the best I could. And if I had known better, I would have done better. That statement alone broke a generational curse and gave me the tools in my toolbox to realize that there are other ways, that there is another way, and it's okay. And even the fact that she was willing to say, hey, I didn't get it all right. And every parent in here needs to be able to admit that you didn't get it and you're not going to get it. But if you're willing to admit, oh, I didn't do that well. I can't tell you how many times I've had to pull my boys to the side and say, I'm sorry. My daughter, I'm sorry. I didn't handle that the right way. And I realize now that that's healing for them. Because some of you are mad because your, your parents are gone on to be with the Lord, but you still remember that one time. And that one time has spoken to every circumstance of your life. I know I got y'all up for a long time. Some of your shoes expired. I saw you sit. And it's still okay. So this month, that's what we're dealing with. It's okay. If you're hurt, if you got trauma in your past, if you've been through a lot of painful situations that are now speaking to your behaviors and you don't want them to be that way, if you need counsel and therapy, you are not by yourself. Tell your neighbor. No, tell somebody around you. Seriously, tell them. 
Grab your Bibles. I don't have much time. John 5, verses 1 through 15. Help me, Holy Ghost, to preach under the power of the Spirit of God. Speak through me and to me and let them understand that there is both healing and wholeness available and accessible to them. Do it, Jesus. John 1, John 5, 1 through 15 reads as follows. This is sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now, there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate, somebody say Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades or porches. Here, a great number of disabled people or invalids used to lie. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you, do you want to get well? He said, sir, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. When I'm trying to get in, somebody else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once, the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which he took, this took place was the Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders, the dignitaries, the naysayers, the super saved and sanctified. He said to the man who had been healed, it's the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat on the Sabbath. But he replied, the man that made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow that told you to pick up your mat and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who he was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd. But later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse will happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders, it was Jesus who made me whole. It was Jesus. Father God, in the name of Jesus, do it. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of our incredible God. And first of all, I want to deal with the reality that there is a distinction and a difference to be made between being healed and being whole. Statistically speaking, there are so many reasons and so many variables of the dynamic of our emotional health that are unresolved, unaddressed, and unhealed. We have a epidemic of numeric data that speaks to the reality of how tragic we have become as a people group, as humans, in the area of emotional health. There is, according to certain statistical records, 50 million people who are dealing with mental illness of some sort or another. And the number of people who are dealing with emotional dynamics centered around and focused on your mental wellness is staggering, to say the least. Millions and millions upon millions of people are inherently contending with the dynamic of having to wrestle with emotional wellness or emotional lack of wellness on a daily basis. Everything surrounding this, every derivative of our experience is now a negative impact on humanity. And at one time, we used to think that this was isolated and relegated to one people group. But please understand that the rate of suicide, thoughts of suicide, depression is increasing in every people group. Please don't make me be plainer than I got to be. But I'll say it this way. At some juncture in our historical context, I recall that when you heard of someone who was thinking about and or committed suicide, the presumption among African-American communities was it wasn't us. But if you look at the statistical data 
at an alarming rate, it is also becoming us. So I want to make sure that you understand it's not isolated to one people group, but every person is susceptible and every group is handling and grappling with the reality of a lack of emotional healing or emotional health. So my admonishment, my prayer, my challenge is this month to help us to not just be healed, but also to be whole. Giving you practical tools, practical skills, practical insight. Giving you access to the things that are necessary in order for you to be healed is a priority for me. Because what I've learned and what I've figured out and what I discovered is that not a lot of people do sermon series and or sermonic moments that focus on your emotional well-being. Now, in context, let me make sure I clarify. Everything about the gospel of Jesus Christ deals with your emotional well-being. It is truly good news to restore faith, confidence, and to increase peace and even introduce joy. But from a very practical, foundational dynamic, a lot of people deal with the what, but not a lot of people deal with the how. And so my prayer is that God would give me intrinsically and and divinely everything that I need in order to equip you and to show you throughout this month the how of handling your emotional well-being and healing from the traumas of your yesterday and walking in the victories of your tomorrow. Let me first of all make sure that you understand that there is a distinction to be made between being healed and being whole. It is highly possible for you to be healed and still not be whole. It is illustrated and illuminated in the context of our scriptural understanding or uh, in the word of, of God when the lady with the issue of blood, the woman with the issue of blood who had been struggling for 12 long years, pressed her way through an impossible circumstance, was willing to go against the grain, was willing to step out of protocol to get to Jesus because she realized that there was a source of healing that was in this man. So much so that I don't even have to be close to him. He doesn't have to call my name. I don't necessarily have to even touch his flesh. If I can just get to the hem of his garment, then I know I'll be made whole. She touched the hem of his garment. He turns around. He stops the procession. He says, who touched me? I felt virtue leave me. Sheepishly, she identifies herself and he says, woman, what's going on here? And she touched the hem of his garment and his declaration, his, his ending and concluding declaration should give excitement, but also should give evidence of this dynamic truth that you can be healed and not be whole. As soon as she touched the hem of his garment, the issue of blood dried up. Not later, instantly she had healing. But what he gave her beyond healing was even more valuable than the healing itself. Because he had healed her physical condition. And now he had to deal with the seed of her emotional well-being. And he says, woman, your faith has made you whole. Which gives evidence that you can be healed and still not be whole. There are so many of us who are walking around with emotional scars and emotional scabs, but we are still not whole. We're still wrestling with the same things, dealing with the same things that we've been dealing with. We're still carrying the same trauma. We're still dealing with the evidence of the same dynamics, but we're not completely whole. The difference between being healed and being whole is simply uh, you are relieved or you are delivered. When I am healed, I am relieved. It is no longer an open wound. It's no longer an open sore. It's no longer something that I have to handle and, and deal with in the same way. The pain has subsided. Now there's simply the evidence of something that had been there. But when I am delivered, I am made whole. I no longer have to bring this up. It no longer informs and instructs my behaviors. I no longer have to contend with this dynamic or this issue and this trauma doesn't hold me hostage because I released it and left it in my yesterday and it does not speak to my tomorrows. 
When you are healed, there is movement. It's a moment in time. When you are healed, it's an incident of recovery. It's just a moment of recovery. But when you are whole, it's a lifetime of peace. I'm no longer having to wrestle with what I wrestled with the same way because I now have a lifetime of peace. I have been made whole. When you are healed, you are worried about reoccurrence. You are continually worried about, oh, I can't do this because it's going to happen again. Oh, I can't. No. no. And when you, are, when you are whole, you are miraculously unbothered and you are continuously assured. I am good. No, no. Are you sure? They're coming today. They're going to be in the room. I know you're going to the dinner. I know y'all got kids together. I know this is the... Are you sure? You're gonna, I'm cool. Quit talking to me about it. I am unbothered because God has done a miraculous thing on the inside and I am whole. And so you, I, my prayer is not just that you find emotional healing. My prayer is that you start on the journey of finding emotional wholeness. You've been healed for a long time. It's been many years and it doesn't hurt the way that it used to hurt, but you still act the way you acted right after the hurt. And because of that, you're still dealing with people the same way that you felt you needed to deal with the last person. Oh, I'm preaching good right now to myself. I want to be right. I want to be whole. Please search me, Lord. That's an old school song. That, it went over some of y'all's heads, so let me go back and retract. Please search me, Lord. Shine the light from heaven. Not on my body. See, the old saints had it together and you didn't even realize they knew what they were talking about. But shine it down on my soul. If you find anything that should not be, take it out, God, and strengthen me. I want to be right I want to be saved and I just want to be whole. Phenomenal example of this reality is found in the text when you see that this man who has been in this condition for 38 years finds himself in a plight that would sicken anybody in the context of simply being around the sick. You can imagine that the atmosphere day in and day out is that he wakes up and wallows in the condition and in the misery of his moment. There's nothing to look forward to. There's nothing to anticipate. There's nothing to be happy about. There's no joy because there's no hope. He is resolved and he has found himself in the circumstance and in a plight that seems to have no resolution and no ending. This is how it's always going to be. What a sad reality it is that when you're at your lowest moment, you make the conclusion that this is how it's always going to be. What an alarming announcement to the church of the necessity of your, your role and your work in the body, that there are people who are sitting next to you right now, who have concluded that as low as they are, this is how it's going to be. The sun comes up, I'm still miserable. The sun goes down, I'm still miserable. The day rolls over and the sun comes up again. You look around and it's the same situation, the same condition. You're surrounded by the same people. You got the same issues, the same problem, same pain, same gnawing, nagging, anxiety, same stress. Sun comes up, I'm miserable. Sun goes down. Imagine doing this for 30 days. That nothing changes. And the hurt, and the pain, the stress, 
the anxiety of tomorrow perpetuates and continues to move forward. The sun comes up, the sun goes down, and you're still miserable. Imagine it's been 12 months. Nothing has changed in your vocational aptitude or your vocational aspirations. Still don't have a job. Still don't have peace. Still don't know how you're going to make it. Still don't know how you're going to put it together. Still feel the hurt. Still dealing with the anxiety. Twelve long months. The sun comes up. The sun goes down. Nothing is changing. And you conclude in your heart, this is how it's always going to be. Imagine you did this for five years. Five years. Your life is at a standstill. You are crippled and handicapped at a place and at a point that is so low. You have relegated yourself to be surrounded by people who are just as low as you are. Misery loves company. Misery is surrounding you on every side to the point that you have concluded that you are to live the rest of your days miserable. Sun comes up, sun goes down, and you're still miserable. Ten years go by. Ten whole years of your life pass, and you are still in the same condition. Still wrestling with the pain that happened 10 years ago. Still dealing with the trauma that happened when you were a child. Still angry at the uncle or the auntie holding on and harboring the hatred that happened to you a decade ago. Sun comes up. Sun goes down. And you still 20 years go by by this time the condition of what is surrounding you has normalized you have actually made light of it so much so that when other people raise and acknowledge it in you and upon you you say it's fine because you've gotten accustomed to the sun goes up sun goes down and you are still miserable as a matter of fact, the condition is so contemptible that after 38 years, you don't even smell the putrid nature of the sickness that is around you. Sickness stinks. Infections, blindness, lame people, Flesh rotting around you because no, the paralytics are lying on the porches and nobody can move. They're lying under these, these porches that are covered on, open on one side, but put up by the locals to deal with or to provide compassion towards those who are in this invalid condition. But they're still lying there and they're surrounded by sickness. You can smell it in the air. It's an unpleasant odor when you come into the region. Even just getting close to the territory, you wonder what is that smell. And that smell is people who have concluded that it's okay to be miserable because the sun comes up, the sun goes down, and for 38 years, you have carried this load, and you have gotten okay being miserable. Even at your lowest point, even after so many decades of your emotional scarring, your physical infirmities, your trauma, your, the baggage, the weight, the misery that you have carried through 
decades, even at the lowest condition, God sent me today, if nothing else, but to give you this good news. You have hope because you are close to Bethesda. You are close to Bethesda. When you scooted out of the bed today, you made progress. When you rolled over and decided I'm going to wipe the sleep from my eyes and if I come with a limp, if I have to hop in, roll in, scoot in, I'm like a deer panting for the river of water, the living water. And if I can just get to the water, if I can just make it to victory today, the sun will come up tomorrow and it will not be the miserable condition that it has always been. I finally gotten enough strength, enough hope to turn on my television, to pull my device out, to listen to the word even on the global campus. And just because I did that, I now have the good news of knowing that I'm right on the edge of my miracle. I'm right on the edge of my breakthrough. I'm right on the edge of leaving some things that have been haunting me for the last 38 years. I'm leaving them in yesterday. As a matter of fact, the air smells different up here. Something just happened inside of me that I had sense enough to get close to the pool of Bethesda, close to the water, the living waters of Jesus Christ. And because I did, I feel good in here right now. Yesterday is going to have to release me and tomorrow is just about to embrace me. I feel the warmth of the sun like I've never felt it on my face before. My flesh feels a little tingly right now. Something is happening because I am closer to the water than I've ever been before. Some of you don't even realize it, but you are closer than you think to healing, to increase, to restoration, to joy, to the return of everything good thing that God has purpose for you your life. You are closer than you think. Weeping may endure for a night. Tell somebody good morning. Joy. Joy comes in the morning. Sit down, sit down. I got too much to do. Come on, sit down, sit down. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Bethesda, the reason some of you couldn't shout is because you have no context, you don't understand, and all you're getting, get an understanding, I got you. No child left behind, you ask the great questions. Here it is. Bethesda means house of pity or house of mercy. So the man was lying really close to the house or the place of mercy or the place where God would have pity on him, he didn't even understand how close he was. Some of you don't even understand how close you are to being free indeed. You thought you were going to church, <laughs> but you really are close to the pool of Bethesda. You thought you were just coming to visit. You thought you were just coming because it's what you do. You were just going to worship. But God says you thought you were coming to worship, but you really were coming to my house of mercy. The pool had five porches or covered verandas open on one side, protected from the sun and the rain, and locals would put those together so that they could actually have compassion or show mercy towards those who were coming in hopes of waiting for the time of year when the, when the angels would trouble the water so that they could go down and they could be healed and recover from their infirmities. The community kindly provided these porches because they knew that the, these conditions that they are that they're suffering and the elements and, and all of the wind, the rain and all of the things, the wind and the sun rather that were, that were coming against them, they needed protection and so they were already being shown mercy and didn't even realize they were having it. Because in their condition, all they could see day in and day out was the misery of their moment. But what they could not see is the mercy of their master. 
that even the small things were God saying, I still got you. Even the, the gesture of goodwill that you didn't even realize was God saying, don't worry about it, I still got you. You know the day that you were about to have a nervous breakdown, the one moment that you were about to lose it all, the one moment that you had decided it's it, I'm done, it's over, I don't know how I can take it, and somebody calls you out of the blue and has a word of encouragement for your life and they haven't talked to you and said, I don't know why I called you, you just been on my heart. How's everything going? You know the moment you were in the grocery store and some stranger started being kind to you and showing you love and mercy or paid for something for you at the counter and you didn't have the money. Come on, somebody talk to me. You didn't know how you were going to pay for it, how you were going to make it, how you got. He's been showing you mercy the whole time. You just didn't know he was doing doing it. He was already being shown mercy. They didn't realize they were in, they were close to the pool and so mercy was all around them. The fact that they lived 30, that he lived 38 years with his condition and never saw healing completely manifested in his physical body. The fact that he didn't lose his mind was God showing mercy. The fact that you're here today when you ain't cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. You didn't walk around and wake up and put your shoes on your hands and your, and your socks, come on somebody, on your ears. Yeah. The fact that you were able to brush your teeth this morning, wash your face, comb your, get out of the bed this morning, make it to the house. The fact God has already been showing you mercy. Here's the good news, here's the good news, here's the good news. The good news is as dead and morbidly putrid as it may seem in your circumstance right now, he's still, you are still lying in the right place. This man was still lying in the right place. Yeah, in scripture, you got to understand that there were five porches. Somebody say five. In scripture, pay attention to the every, every dynamic detail of how God put this thing together is absolutely stunning and amazing. Because you don't even realize that God in the ultimate des design of his divine strategy is orchestrating and putting things around you that are symbols of his grace and his mercy. And because you are not in tune or attuned to his voice or know his strategy, you are missing what God is doing. As bad as this man's condition was, for 38 years, God had a strategy and it was literally all around him. In scripture, the number five, somebody say five. How many porches were there? Five. In scripture, the number five represents grace. And it is grace that was given to the people who gathered at the pool of Bethesda. And certainly the grace and the mercy of God provides the Lamb of God for our spiritual healing according to John 1 and 29. And even pay attention to where he was lying. The Bible says in the first part, sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the sheep gate, somebody say sheep, sheep gate, there is a pool, and the pool is named Bethesda. It's not accidental that the pool is near the sheep gate. It's not accidental that the pool of Bethesda, which means house of mercy, and five porches, which, is, which makes it a place of grace, is near the sheep gate. Certainly there's grace and mercy here. Certainly the Lamb of God has to be present in order for the spiritual healing to be manifested and take place. Yes, they received physical healing, but they were also spiritually healed as is embodied in God's example through Christ Jesus when he met the man at the pool of Bethesda. The sheep gate is where sheep were gathered. Please hear me well. There were 10 gates that surrounded the city of Jerusalem. 
There were 10 gates that were used even in the book of Nehemiah when they were rebuilding the city. They, 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 they did it by entering and exiting and utilizing 10 different gates. There was the inspection gate. There was the east gate. There was the horse gate. There was the water gate. There was the fountain gate. There was the dung gate. There was the valley gate. There was the old gate. There was the fish gate. And there was the sheep gate. In Nehemiah 3 and 1, then Eliashab, it says, then Eliashab the high priest rose up with his brethren, the priests, and they built the sheep gate gate and it was the only gate that was consecrated and set aside or made holy as a gate because the sheep gate was the first to be restored it was rebuilt watch this by the high priest Ah, oh, it's going over your head let me work with it for a minute here we go no child left behind come closer I got you this gate was the only one, the first one that was re restored, and it was the only one that was consecrated and made a holy gate because it was built by the high priest and his fellow priest. This was the only gate that was set aside and called holy because it was used as the gate from which they brought the sheep in for the temple sacrifices. Whenever they would go and sacrifice a lamb, the place or the stations where they would get the lambs from was always held right outside of the sheep gate because the sheep gate was with a gate that was allowed or they were allowed to use in order to bring the temple sacrifices into the city and to worship before God. It was called the sheep gate because it was the entrance where the temple, uh, where, where the markets were and the sheep could go to the temple and the sheep pool where the sheep were washed and made ready for the sacrifice. Y'all missed it. It just went over your head. I got you. No problem. Come on. Come on. Go with me. Thousands of years later, when Jesus was on earth, when he went into the city of Jerusalem, I want you to hear me well. He didn't go through the east gate. He didn't go through the inspection gate. He didn't go through the horse gate. He didn't go through the water gate. He didn't go through the dung gate, the valley gate, the old gate, the fish gate. When Jesus entered into Jerusalem thousands of years later, he entered through the sheep gate. Why does that matter? Because he was the lamb, the only one pure, blameless, and holy to bring into the temple to sacrifice his life for the sake of everybody else. It's going over your head. I got you. So here's the other thing. Pay attention. Remember that the sheep gate was actually made by the high priest. Well, we have a high priest and his name is Jesus. So how befitting that the, the gate that was made by the high priest was entered into by our high priest. The gate that was made for the sheep or the lamb to be led as a sacrifice for worship was the same gate that the lamb who was slain for the foundation of the world and for the sins of all mankind entered through the same gate. All right, that ain't good enough. Let me help you understand. You're lying in the right place. Let me tell you, you are still lying in the right place because the sheep gate was also the gate that led you into the city and up to Golgotha's hill, which was the path that Jesus took for a crucifixion. Ah, bless your name, God. Thank you, God, that when I thought I was at my lowest moment, when I thought it was over for me, when I thought I was going to hang up the towel, when I thought that my mind was going to be snatched away from here, you reminded me that I'm still lying in the right place. Bless his name. Jesus' sacrifice as the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. The sheep gate is the salvation through, it represents the salvation through Jesus Christ or his death on the cross. And understand, let me tell you about the sheep gate. Let me give you a little bit more. Y'all got time? I got time today. Watch this. This gate had no bolts and it had no bars. It was the only gate that you could literally open and close freely salvation freely is available to anybody 
that will come through this gate toward Jesus. It was built by the high priest and Jesus is our high priest. His death opens the way and restores free access to the Father. You no longer have to have the priest and the prophet. But because he ripped the veil of the temple, you can go to God free. He took the hinges off the doors. Took the bars off and says, I am available to anybody that desires. Whosoever will, let him come. The sheep gate is mentioned at the start of the chapter and again at the end of the chapter. Because everything starts and everything ends with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The question is, what are you panicking for and you're lying in the right place? Yeah, why are you so stressed, so worried, so full of anxiety? Why have you allowed yourself to get to this place and this point when you're lying? But pastor, you don't understand, I'm not lying in the right place. The fact that you hear my voice right now, the fact that you still are alive and you have breath in your body right now, the fact that blood is still flowing in your veins right now. The fact that somebody is telling you what I'm preaching about right now. The fact that it's in the airways, it's in the atmosphere of your audible nerves and your auditory nerves are carrying it to your brain and your brain cells are still firing your neurons and I wish I had somebody to understand. They're still talking to the essence of your being. The fact that you are here right now hearing this word means that he strategically ordered your steps, Change your dial, put you on the right page, set you to the right website so that you can remind yourself you are lying in the right place. You are close to Bethesda and you are lying by the sheep gate. So thanks be to God that it's not over for you. You're not done. It is not finished. He is not done with you. There is still more to come. Here's, here's what you got to know. There's a lot of sick people that were around. I need to give you some practical insight. Here's the how. Here's the how. I can't, can't let you leave without giving you the how. Here it is. See, we naturally assemble around our own kind. It is a natural progression. Let me tell you why. Because it's what makes us comfortable. When you walk into a room and you don't see anybody that looks like you, has your same background, your same condition, same circumstance, same situation, you immediately feel uncomfortable. And there are some people who won't even walk in the room because they feel so. Assembling with those who are different requires discomfort. We don't like to be uncomfortable. But without discomfort, there's no growth. So we would rather lie around sick people who are all comfortable and complacent being sick than to put ourselves in the room with a person that can help us get through our sickness. We'd rather be assimilated into a room of comfort where there's no growth than to become uncomfortable and reach across to other dynamics and other spectrums of existence to make sure that we have an opportunity to be completely made whole. Oh, help us, Jesus. So they lied around the pool. They lied around the pool of Bethesda in their sickness because they were okay being miserable. The challenge with assembling with your own kind is that you become what you behold. Pay attention to who the text says was lying around. The blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. The blind simply means there were people that had a physical impairment and they could not see. But I want to take it a step further. Many of you are lying around the blind and they still can see. They just refuse to see what's being said. They're blinded by their own sight. And if you're not careful, you keep lying around people who are blind, 
and blinded in their vision. They can't envision themselves in a better tomorrow. You will eventually find yourself digressing to a point where you start doubting the vision that God has given to you. You got to be careful about laying around the lane because those who struggle to walk, moving but complaining, moving but doubting, moving but murmuring, going through life but they're really not enjoying a bit of it, miserable in their existence even though they're functional in their actions. You got to watch out about laying around the lane. The lane will make you lame. And before you know it, you complaining about what they complaining about and you don't even dislike what they dislike. <laughs> Got to be careful about laying around the blind and the lame, but you definitely don't want to lay around the paralyzed. Those are the people who are immobile. In other words, those are the people that tell you there is no way. It's not going to happen. You can't do that. You surely won't qualify. It's not going to be in your name. I tried it and it didn't work. It doesn't work. And they get mad and angry at you because you refuse to believe what they are saying. You got to be careful about lying around the paralyzed. There was one who was there at the pool who had been there for 38 years. 38 years he has carried the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed until he himself has become paralyzed. And the question that Jesus asks is one that I think is, it is of the utmost profundity. It literally penetrates and pierces my heart and my mind to the point where it's, it's so simplistic in its content. But in context, it's the most magnificent question. And the one that all of us should have to pose to ourselves on a perpetual and a continual basis. And even when I look at the condition of your circumstance and how long you have been in that place, how long you have avoided and evaded counseling and therapy, how long you have allowed the lame to tell you it's not good, and to complain and murmur about your situation and yourself. How long you have allowed the paralyzed to pull you into a place of paralysis where you now don't even want to go and go after it and do it and accomplish it and achieve it and believe it and dream it and hop to it. You, you, you have no desire whatsoever. How long, when I look at this, it is the most profound question and it is a question that I pose to each and every one of you. And I'm going to do it with the emphasis and the inflection that I believe Christ had to have felt in his heart after looking at the man being this close to a miracle, being this close to a breakthrough, being this close every single Sunday, sitting in the same section, the same seat and mad if somebody else is sitting in it, being this close to a breakthrough. Through, coming through the sheet gate every single week and seeing the power of Jesus Christ and knowing the influence that he yields and listening to his truth preached on a regular basis but they've been this close this long and still not made it in the water they've been close but they haven't yet so much as dipped their toe in the water they haven't scooped down they haven't rolled down they haven't crawled down they haven't flipped down they haven't they haven't inched down they have been here in the church for 38 years. They have served on the usher's board, the deacon's board, the trustee's ministry. They have been in the choir, on the praise team. They have served in the parking ministry. They have worked with the young people. They have been saved for 38 years. They've been close to the water for 38 years. They have lifted up their hands on cue. They have sang songs because they were good and they liked to beat. They have been in the worship atmosphere. They have been exposed to praise and worship. They have seen the power fall. They have watched other people be slain in the spirit. They have seen this for 38 years, but they have concluded to be paralyzed and still have not made it in the water. And so the question that he asked is one I think to be appropriate on every front. He says, do you want to be well? But, 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 
Before I give you my instructions, before I tell you how to do this, before I give you my admonishment, before I train you, teach you, coach you, before I lift you up, before I equip you, before I, I, I expose you to the speaker that's coming, before I give you the profound nature of what's happening emotionally and psychologically and how to contend with that spiritually, before I show you the ramifications of what you're dealing with in your mind and how it plays out in your actions, before I get to any part of this sermon series, before I deal with you according to the word of God, the will of God and the way of God, before I break it down, before I open it up, before I enlighten you, before I instruct you, before I encourage you, let me ask you this question. After 38 years of being this close to the water, do you want to get well? How long has your trauma been affecting you like this? You haven't sought how to get in the water. How long have you been holding on to what your daddy did and didn't do? How long have you had this PTSD? How long have you been claiming the damage of yesterday and declaring that damage over your tomorrow? How long do you want to get well? I want you to pay attention to his response. His response is simply this. Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool. Same response many of us have on a regular basis. But pastor, I don't have anybody to put me in the pool. God says, I didn't send anybody to put you in the pool because I needed you to realize that what's in you is greater than what's on you. And we have this treasure, and he hid it in earthen vessels. He said, I needed you to see you can do it. No, 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 you're missing it. You can do it. You waiting on somebody to take you to therapy. You waiting on somebody to take you to counseling. You ain't on somebody to show you how to do it. No, I've already put inside of you the wisdom, the acumen, the, all you are missing is your own desire. You got to put in the work. If you put in the work, I'll work it out. You can't tell me I'm not wired that way. You cannot tell me I'm this close to my healing. And I sit here and let you talk me out of going after what I see. You can't convince me under any circumstance that I cannot have what is right in front of me when God promised that he would not withhold any good gifts from those who love. You can't convince me that I will not see my dreams materialize and realize when I'm sitting in the evidence every single day and is building my car. You can't convince me that the vision is not going to come to pass when he promised me that if I delight myself in him he would give me the desire of my you cannot tell me that it's not going to happen when he says I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me God says I didn't do it for you because I needed you to understand you can do it if you put in the work, I'll work it out. Face it. Confront it. Deal with it. Change it. Then I'll heal it and I'll make you whole. I'll heal your soul. There is a bomb. Ah! There is a bomb in Gilead. And I will heal your soul's diseases. But Pastor How, I want to be made whole. I, I'm like the songwriter of old. I want to be right. I want to be saved. I want to be whole. Here it is right quick. Real simple. First thing you need to do is go to verse 8. Then Jesus said to him, get up. Pick up your mat. And Walk. Get up, pick up your mat, 
First thing you need to do is elevate your thinking. Change your perspective. Get. It's been that long. It's just been a week. Take your thinking. Go. Take your relationships. Get up. Get up. I'll never forget when I was little. I used to fall out on the floor. My daddy would come in the room and he had two things to say. One, two words to say. Simple. Get up. Crying stops. The tantrum goes away. All of the emotion seems to just disappear. Because my father told me, get up. The father is telling you, get up. Change your vantage point. Expose yourself to new altitudes. You can't go where you're going and stay where you are. You can't hang around the same people and expect a different destination. You can't be who you were and who you are at the same time. You got to get up. How do I get up? When my boys were babies, they would walk up to me. They just do this. And I knew immediately what they were saying that without them opening their mouth. They just they said, pick me up, daddy. Because when I get in your arms, I see clearer. Pick me up, daddy. Because I can see over my circumstance as long as I'm in your arms. Pick me up, daddy. Because I'm feeling suffocated down here. But if I get in your arms, you will carry me in a way that gives me peace, comfort, and security. Pick me up, daddy. Get, get up. The second thing he says is pick up your mat. You cannot keep laying on the symbol of your brokenness. You can't heal where you were hurt. Help me, Holy Ghost. Time, tragedy, and turmoil. Get this. You will carry it with you. The symbol of what you went through, you will carry it with you. There is no ray gun. I know it's on men in black. There's no device that eradicates the memory of your reality. But he said, get up and carry the mat of your memory with you. Take the thing that is symbolic of your misery and carry that with you. How are you going to tell me to carry that? I'm supposed to leave it because that's the problem that you've been running into is you feel that you're going to forget just because you forgave. It goes with you but it does not inform your decisions. It does not shape your actions. It only becomes a testimony because now the people that knew you when you were lying on that mat get to see that I was who I was. I went through what I went through. I dealt with what I dealt with. I carried what I carried. I endured what I endured. See, the reason he wants you to carry this is because he needs you to get over your guilt and your shame. Now, when you are free and free indeed, you will testify, I was a crack addict. I was on drugs. I was an alcoholic. I was incarcerated. I was, you will be free and free indeed. And now it becomes your. Because when somebody sees you carrying your mat, they're going to realize that if you could pick up your mat, if you could get off of your sick bed,
if you could come out of your depression, if you could get your healing, if you could receive your breakthrough, then maybe there's hope for me. I need you to have your mat because your mat is evidence of what God has done. As a matter of fact, I see some mats out here in the sanctuary right now. You hadn't always been like this. It hadn't always worked this way. It hadn't always been in this condition. But thanks be to God, you are able to get up and carry your testimony with you. God brought me out. God delivered me. God healed my body. God saved me. God raised me. God lifted me up. God did it. 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 When I look back over my life and I begin to think things, think them over, I can surely say that I've been blessed. I just got to change Sister Dottie's words a little bit. I don't just have a testimony. I am the testimony. If you want to see a miracle, look at me. If you want to see deliverance, look at me. If you want to know what breakthrough looks like, look at me. If you want to know what healing looks like, look at me. Is there anybody here that knows you're the testimony? Don't wait for your neighbor, but give confidence and show the evidence by the measure of your praise you brought me out you lifted me up you carried me over and now I'm gonna carry my mat and I'll keep walking forward I'll walk into my tomorrow I'm walking into my new job I'm walking into my new relationship I'm walking into my new season I'm walking into my new house I'm walking Walking into my new peace. Pick up your mat and walk, 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 walk. Somebody walk it out. Somebody walk it out. Somebody walk it out. I'm going higher. I'm going higher. Somebody walk it out. I'm going in. I'm going over. I can't stay right here. But do you realize, Smokey, you got a mat on your shoulders? Yeah, I realize. And because I got a mat, you can carry your mat too. Get up, get up. Get up, get up. Get up, get up. What are you waiting on? You're close to the water. Get up, get up, and walk it out. Shout like it didn't happen. Praise him like it's already done. Bless him like you know you came through. Thank him like he brought you out of it. Deliverance, breakthrough, miracles, joy, restoration, healing, breakthrough, miracles. Walk, 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 walk. Walk, 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 walk it out, walk it out, walk through your haters, walk through your doubters, walk through depression, walk through your pain, walk through your sickness, walk through your sorrow, walk through your heartbreak, walk through your down season, walk through the darkness, walk, walk. Walk, walk, walk it out. the storm and rain I've had to wrestle with heartache and pain but I made it I made it 
I made it, I made it. <laughs> I know somebody else got the same mat on your shoulders. I made it, I made it. It wasn't always easy, but I made it, I made it. Is there anybody that knows you made it? And it was by the grace and the mercy of God. Don't wait for your neighbor. Don't wait on your haters. Shout in the midst of your doubters. I need about a thousand people to open your mouth and tell the dying world if you just walk through it there is joy on the other side if you've been through a divorce you ought to testify to somebody there is joy on the other side if you've been through cancer you ought to testify there is healing on the other side if you've been through something you ought to tell the world weeping may endure for a night but joy joy oh joy joy comes in the morning good morning y'all you're closer than you think jump in and dance jump in and dance dance in the rain bathe in the water jump in and get yours Satan you lose Satan we win I win. Ah, ah, yeah. Hey. Your doubters are coming. Your doubters are coming. Soon as God led him to his healing. Church folk. Church people. Super saved saints. Ain't never did nothing wrong. Said we ain't supposed to be carrying nothing on the Sabbath. He said, I'm doing what he told me to do. Who is he? He said, I don't really know right now. I was so caught up in the fact that I'm healed, that I'm delivered. I forgot to ask. I forgot to ask the man's name. Well, well a few days later, Jesus shows up as if to tell the boy. He said, listen, I'm about to take your life to another level. But I needed you to understand. Well, 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 Jesus, why did you leave and not tell me who you were? He said, because I was trying to show you that before you get the elevation, you're going to have to learn how to deal with the isolation. Before I take your life to the next level, I have to make sure you understand that everybody ain't gonna be happy about your mat. Everybody ain't gonna understand your mat. Everybody is not gonna appreciate your mat. And there'll be some people that write you off because of your mat. But when you run into the Pharisees the next time, when you see the dignified the next time, you can go ahead and tell them who healed your body, who brought you out of that season, who carried you into your new moment. And I can read in my mind that when he ran into the Pharisees the next time, that all he had to say was, Jesus did it. Jesus did it. Who brought you out? Jesus did it. Who lifted you up? Jesus did it. Who paid your bills? Jesus did it. Who healed your mind? Jesus did it. Who mended your broken heart? Jesus did it. I need somebody in this place to throw your head back and say, Jesus did it. Who healed your body? Who brought you out? Who kept you? Who made your mind 
that ease and that peace? Who regulated your thoughts? Who brought your pressure down? Who leveled out your diabetes? Who healed you and delivered you? Who restored you? Jesus did it. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Oh, oh, for all the things. For all, for all of my things, for the hurt, for the pain, for the guilt, for the shame, for all the things, oh, 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 all the things. I got some big things and some little things. You got some small things and some tall things, but we all got some things. I know you got your mad. You ought to thank God for all the things. He said, I wouldn't make it. I thought I wouldn't be here right now, but he kept me through all the things. When you realize that he meant to kill you, that you should have lost your mind, but God, but God, but God, but God. I'm grateful for the things. To God, you sing it, I ain't gonna do it. Be the glory to, come on, tell him. Be the glory. Tell him. Think about your matter and tell him. For the things, for the things he has done with his blood, with his. You have saved me. With your power, you reach way down and raise, raise me oh, to God be all of the glory, all of the glory for He has. Oh, To God be the glory. This is going to be a month of healing for you. You're going to get up this month. You're going to get up this month. You're about to pick your man up this month. To God be the glory for, for the things you have done with his blood yeah. I'm grateful because he saved me I should have been I would have been I could have been but God he reached way down For the things, for the things, stay right there, don't move. I just need you to think about your things. I just need you to think about the things that he's done in your life for the things. 
every door he's open how he kept you when you didn't even know you were lost for the thing how he spoke peace in the midnight hour when nobody else was around he can encourage your spirit he encouraged your soul I am grateful for the things yeah. I thank you Lord 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 yeah for the things you have done somebody praise him for the things somebody bless him for the things take up your mat take up your mat take up your mat I don't look like what I've been through I don't smell like what I've been through I'm not gonna act like what I've been through take up your mat Take up your mat. I don't know who this is for, but it's over. 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 God, I thank you for what you've done in this place. Oh. Thank you for what you're yet doing even now in the hearts and minds of your people. And thank you for what you're going to do. Thank you for freedom. <laughs> thank you for reminding us that he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. That's what we're asking for this month is freedom. We don't want to be this close to the pool and not do the work. We don't want to be this close to a miracle and not hear the message. We don't want to be this close to the pool and not receive the miracle. Thank you for this month and how you're going to break and destroy generational curses. That the bondage of yesterday, that the cycle of our own experience will be broken. That we will not endure and enter into the same cycle again. That you'll destroy it through the power of your blood and the work of your Holy Spirit within us. And that we'll be bold enough to decree and declare our deliverance and even offer our testimony. Thank you for your healing power. <sighs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you that we've been lying in our misery, but we didn't realize we were close to our master. And thank you for realizing and recognizing our need and meeting it. We give you glory for the things. Not just the things you have done, but in this moment we want to lose a praise for the things that you are about to do. In Jesus' name. Come on, let the redeemed shout hallelujah. Come on, let the real believers shout thank you, Jesus. And amen. Lord, if there be man, woman, boy, girl here under the sound of my voice who's not received you in their hearts as, your, as their Savior, first start them there. Push them into a place of conviction and convincing that they would receive you first, knowing that that's the prerequisite in order for them to experience the benefits of you and to receive the liberty that's going to come, the deliverance, the healing, the manifestation of your grace and mercy is already around them. You've extended it and they don't even know it. Equip them with the tools and the eyes of understanding and the ears of hearing and the heart to receive and the mind to do so that they can be all that you desire for them to be and be glorified. Our prayer, our plea is that you are glorified in Jesus name. Every head still bowed, every eye closed. If you're here today and you want to receive Christ as your Savior, if you're joining us online, 
you can text the word SAVED to 844-334-1191. Text SAVED to 844-344-1191. Someone will immediately connect with you. You can tell us in the chat room. We will send you the information and you can click the link. If you're in this room, just slip your hand in the air. I want to pray the prayer of salvation with you. Real simple. Ain't nothing deep, nothing spooky. It's just as simple as God has always declared and wanted it. God bless you, sister. God bless you, brother. Brothers and sisters joining me around the world. This is the day that you have been hoping for, praying for. This is why God brought you here. This is your spiritual birthday. Amen. Put them down. Family, pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord, thank you for this day and for preserving my life for this very moment. I admit I'm a sinner and I'm in need of a Savior. I'm so grateful that you forgive me. I believe you were born, I believe you died, and by faith, I believe you were raised from the dead. With this confession, I'm excited to say, I am saved. Can somebody give God glory in this place? Hallelujah.